Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. It's been another intensive week on the ESCOM and electricity front, with the utility turning 100 amid ongoing load shedding and criminality, as well as the eventual release of the regulations giving effect to the electricity state of disaster. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss these developments. Hi Terence. Hi oh, Chanel. Firstly, there were some interesting revelations that emerged during ESCOM's centenary events. Yes, these seem to have been going on since mid-February, which is before Andre de Reiter exited the organisation. And part of the event that was always planned to unearth in the front of Megawatt Park, there's that famous energy statue, the Rockman. And just in front of that, they had buried in 1999 a, a, um, a time capsule which contained all sorts of things from that decade or from that time, uh, including a letter from the then CEO, Alan Morgan, uh, talking to the Eskimites of 2023 and reflecting on, you know, uh, his sort of his hopes, but also some of the challenges that were really confronting Eskom. And I think the most startling one, uh, where there were actually two that came out, the one was that municipal debt or debt to Eskom or non-payment was really becoming a, big issue and we know that last week in the budget it was clear that they had now risen to close to 60 billion rand of outstanding debt payments to Eskom and without really much visibility of resolving that and it's a big risk to the utility and to electricity supply. Uh, and then the other major one was that uh, in that letter of uh, April uh, 1999 Alan Morgan said we're going to run out of electricity in 2007 so we need to start getting our ducks in our row and in his speech at the event uh, he reflected on that and said you know we had 24 power stations at the time and we it was clear that we we're going to need far more at that stage coal was the only real game in town and Eskom's only really built as we know Madupi and Kassile very belatedly with lots of defects with lots of corruption and we know that Kassile only one unit is, is producing there so the visibility that Eskom already had then and, and government was aware of, you know, that we were going to run out of electricity in 2007 and we know that load shedding, almost like clockwork, started in around 2007 and then the calamitous sort of pre that uh, policy regulatory um, governance issues at Eskom and then since that um, with very poor implementation, embedded corruption, in especially in the new build program. I think we've come to this point where you know, Eskom's couldn't really celebrate its 100th year, it just had to mark the day. Uh, and we marked it as a nation with stage four load shedding and this week sort of stage four and five, that's what we're sort of navigating at the moment. As you mentioned, the celebrations were overshadowed by load shedding, but also by allegations of ongoing criminality. Yes, uh, the load shedding as we know, and then the criminality. I think this has really been amplified by that uh, interview that uh, Andre de Reiter had on ENCA, where he sort of outlined in broad terms what he had told government and actually communicated to his shareholder minister. And there's revelations now, not just to his shareholder minister, but these had been communicated to his board, uh, to uh, highest ranking police officials and the people in the presidency. So he had communicated this, despite the theatre around people saying that he needs to name names and lay charges, the, the communication was clear. There was a privately led investigation, it seems, uh, under um, the Reuters leadership, or, uh, and that is very, very worrying. I mean, the, the revelations that have come around the four coal mafia syndicates that have penetrated the supply chains in Mpumalanga in particular, are very, very worrying. The line of sight uh, from some of these syndicates to very high ranking political uh, politicians. And it seems clear now from the portage that these are all the way up to cabinet level is extremely disturbing and uh, may be a reason for why we're taking so long or why the president is taking so long to name a cabinet because uh, th that should have already been announced, especially given that we had this urgent state of disaster announcement and that we we're going to have an electricity minister uh, at, at the time of this recording. Uh, neither of those had happened. Um, I'm sure it's imminent. This sort of criminality and these revelations 
I think, are weighing on that decision. Do you think the state of disaster regulations will help in tackling these problems? I think that's very much open to disagreement and debate. Um, one, you know, is it a state of disaster when you announce something in, uh, in states of the nation address and then two weeks later you still don't have the regulations to bring that into effect? I mean, it raises serious questions. Is it a disaster or not? You know, you, you have to, if you're going to declare a disaster, you need to move with some speed. We didn't move with speed at all. Then if you look through the details of the regulations, it has some sort of sweeping uh, implications for environmental protection and for procurement. And you know, a lot of the reaction can be seen as paranoid and extreme and hyperbolic. But given what we the experience that South Africa has had during the, uh, the COVID state of the disaster and the high levels of criminality and corruption that associated with that, I think people are justifiably paranoid. So, and when you do go through the, 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 the details, I think as was highlighted in Parliament this week, there are concerning elements within that, uh, depending on what decisions and what directions emerge around some of those regulations, particularly around exemptions around environmental protection and what that's going to mean for the type of procurement we do. So I think it is a disaster. Uh, there's no doubt. It's taking South Africa's confidence right down. Anxiety levels across society are very high. Stress levels are very high as a result of load shedding. It's having impact on other infrastructure, particularly water. So it is a disaster. But whether the state of disaster is the right tool uh, in this current environment and whether it really is being implemented as a state of disaster, as I say, weeks later, and the regulations only came. Now we're going to only see the directions that give effect to those regulations coming out. So really, is, is, is it the right tool? Uh, is it something that's going to create more risk than reward? Is something that society, I think, is going to keep a very tight watch on uh, because we just can't afford for this level of criminality that's penetrated Eskom to penetrate the state of disaster. Uh, it's just untenable society. So I think... Um, We'll have to wait and see, but uh, there's a definite concern, and I think the concern is justified. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching, and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.